Markor gather for their annual rout. Males must fight for the right to breed, but on these sheer cliffs, any slip by either animal could be fatal. A snow leopard, the rarest of Himalayan animals. It's a female returning to her lair. These are the first intimate images of snow leopard ever filmed in the wild. She greets her one-year-old cub. Her den is well chosen. It has exceptional views of the surrounding cliffs. On these treacherous slopes, no hunter other than the snow leopard would have a chance of catching such agile prey. A female with young makes an easier target. Large paws give an excellent grip, and that long tail helps her balance. Silently, she positions herself above her prey. The sea ice will not freeze properly till it reaches minus two degrees. For now, it's still too warm. This ice is no use to the bears. They can't walk on it to hunt. The normally unsocial bears gather in groups, trapped on the shoreline. <coughs> This is the time of year, the male bears spar. Only the biggest bears had the energy reserves to fight. After a summer without food, the bear systems are in low gear. These aerobics help warm them up in readiness for the winter hunting ahead.
It's late October, but still the sea hasn't frozen. For every degree rise in the average temperature, the summer melt is extended by a whole week. That's more bad news for polar bears. Smaller, younger bears don't have the energy of the big males. Each day they are without food, they lose nearly a kilo. Some have lost half of their body weight. These hungry bears must now rest in the snow and conserve energy. All they can do is wait. Sunlight brings a flush of new greenery to the forest floor. These plant pioneers now have full access to the endless summer sunshine. Fireweed is the first to stake its claim. It flowers through the hazy days, and Alaskans call it summer's timekeeper. The flowers unfold from the bottom of the plant. When they reach the top, that's the end of summer. It's a warning that despite the summer heat, the first snows of winter are only weeks away. High up in the Talkeetna Mountains, there's one Alaskan who's already prepared. The collared pika. He spent his entire summer hard at work. When the winter comes, his favorite grasses and sedges will be buried under the snow. But he's not worried. He's been saving food for the lean months ahead. Hidden among the rocks is his winter larder. He's carefully positioned it to catch the sun's rays, which dry and cure his supply. Half a meter wide and 30 centimeters deep, this haystack is his survival rations. He's chosen the contents meticulously. He's picked some toxic plants. These will decompose slower and keep food for eating fresher for longer. Like all Alaskans, he knows that winter preparations start early. And you have to make the most of summer's bounty. The sun is getting lower. Summer is drawing to a close. A cold autumn rain hangs on the rose hips. The last harvest of the year. The days of succulent young plants are long gone. Soon there will be nothing left to eat. This is why bears hibernate. With no more food to be found, the bears slow down their bodies to sleep until spring. Mother has led them to the canyon. The shorter days trigger hormones, acting like sleeping pills, making them drowsy. While hibernating, their heart rate will drop from 90 to 8 beats per minute. They'll go without eating, drinking, or passing waste for seven months. 
the time for suckling is almost over. The first snow on the mountain tops signals the change in seasons. But true to form, Mum is well prepared. With grizzlies and coyotes about, she's already found a secure den site deep in the canyon. But the slope is loose and treacherous. She's been digging this den, concealed by a fallen tree, for weeks. Bears slumber lightly while hibernating, keeping their brains at a higher temperature than the rest of their bodies. If trouble comes, they can still respond, with good reason. Grizzlies have been known to dig up dens and eat black bears alive. This winter, the family will hibernate together. Thanks to their mother, the cubs have made it through their first summer. At times, they've been lucky to survive. Next summer, she'll abandon them. Their lesson's over, the cubs will have to make it on their own. But by then, they'll be ready to go their separate ways in big sky country. A beaver of the family that lives here in this lake at the foot of the Teton Mountains in Wyoming. While beavers can get around perfectly well on land, they're most at home in the water, where their webbed hind feet and large paddle-like tail make them powerful swimmers above and below the surface. Like marmots, beavers feed on all kinds of vegetation and eat wood as well as leaves. And they're accomplished engineers. This great pond is entirely their own creation. Only a few years ago, this shallow pebbly stream flowed straight down the valley. Then a family of beavers moved in and built a dam. The main body of it is built of boulders. On the downstream side, it's been lined with logs, some of them big and quite heavy. And on this side, it's been packed with mud and vegetation. It's been built so accurately that it is to within a few inches horizontal across its entire length of about 150 yards from one side to the other. And the lake it's created stretches upstream for almost a mile. So important is their dam to them that if they detect the slightest leak, usually by hearing the sound of trickling water, they start repair work immediately. Mud is needed as well as logs.
The repair team will labor away until the leak is fully repaired. Maintaining the water at a high level brings the beavers several advantages. One of which is that it floods the surrounding woodlands and so enables them to swim in safety to their main source of food. They increase the distance they can swim by digging channels that lead into the very heart of the woodland. Here they can use their sharp incisor teeth to strip off the bark from a fallen tree trunk and nibble at it while still being close enough to water to slip away should a bear or a mountain lion turn up. Their network of channels also enables them to ferry whole branches back to their pond. And there, where the water is deepest, they dive down and push each branch firmly into the mud at the bottom. This is the beaver's fridge, where the vegetation will keep fresh through the long winter when the pond is covered with ice. Stocking the fridge takes a lot of work, and the beavers are at their busiest in autumn. At one side of the lake stands their lodge, a fortress built of branches and boulders that's so strong that not even a bear could break into it. The only entrance is through tunnels that open underwater, and the beavers take refuge here whenever they are alarmed. was a warning signal to say that danger was around, that's to say me. And now I may not see the beavers for some time. They can stay underwater for five minutes at a time, up to 15 if they need to. They can actually get back to the safety of their lodge without putting their head above the surface for a single second. Most lodges have at least two different entrances. By October, winter is well underway, but whereas marmots would now be hibernating, the beavers are still active and will remain that way throughout the winter. Even when the pond ice is over completely, they're still able to swim under the ice to get back and forth to their lodge. No one knew exactly what went on inside the lodge during winter, so when the beavers were away, we installed a couple of infrared cameras in order to find out. A 
A branch from the fridge is being brought back to the lodge for the whole family to feed on. And another. No wonder they don't need to hibernate with this ingenious setup. The lodge is warm and safe even in midwinter, and the only sign of activity in the snug home beneath the snow is hot air rising from the vent at the top. Inside, our cameras catch a glimpse of what, at first sight, looks like a very small beaver. It's a muskrat. There are a pair of them in here. This is a new observation. Do the beavers actually know in the pitch blackness that there are strangers among them? We notice that the muskrats regularly left the lodge to forage under the ice. And on several occasions, they returned a few minutes later with a load of fresh reeds. Perhaps the muskrats are paying rent by regularly providing fresh bedding for the lodge. Maybe that is why the beavers accept them and even allow them to share their food. Infrared lights, however, are no longer welcome, it seems. We think of barn owls as birds of dusk and night, haunters of the dark, creatures of the moon. So to see them hunting by day, out here along the Essex sea wall, startles me. In daylight, they resemble apparitions, the closest thing to ghosts in the bird world, flying with a supernatural vigilance. To me, they set the land over which they move alight with wildness. They pass through the air, these birds, with the silence of falling snow. What does it take for Lily to get airborne? To find out, Lloyd and Rose have enlisted the help of bird expert Professor Graham Martin and high-speed cameraman Mark Payne Gill. For a bird to take to the air, it has to overcome two forces. Gravity, the invisible pull that keeps us grounded. And drag, which is the resistance we experience as we move through the air. Birds use their wings to create lift and thrust. But how do they do it? Birds' wings are the shape of an airfoil. Air traveling over the top of the wing has to travel faster than air traveling beneath. This creates a difference in air pressure, which generates lift. To gain forward momentum, birds flap their wings. This makes the air flowing over them spiral off the trailing edge. These vortices thrust the bird forwards and upwards.
These are the basic principles of all flight. But what's so unique about the way owls fly? We fly quite a few different types of bird, yeah. varying sizes. Yeah. But the one thing I notice about the owls is they always appear to be a lot slower than yeah. the flying than yeah. the other birds. Well, all birds have got different wing shapes and they can fly at different speeds. It's just like aircraft. So if you look at the wing size of a barn owl, it's actually got a very big wing and so they can fly very slow, very controlled. To really understand the barn owl's slow flight, Lloyd's putting Lily to the test against two of his other birds. Maisie, the grey-like goose, a long-distance endurance flyer. And Moses, the peregrine falcon, one of the fastest birds on Earth. Peregrine takes the lead. Its long and pointed wings are quite flat, designed for speed and maneuverability, which it needs to hunt. The goose is next. Weighing three kilograms, its relatively short and narrow wings work hard to get it airborne. The barn owl has the largest wings in relation to its body, and its airfoil is very curved, which generates a huge amount of lift. So the barn owl can fly slower, and with fewer wing beats than most other birds. 